Welcome to my guide to computer forensics and investigations, fifth edition chapter review. We are doing chapter eight, recovering a graphics file. All right, so the objective is to describe the type of graphic file formats, explain the types of data compression, how to locate and recover graphic files, how to identify unknown file types, and explain the copyright issues with graphics. So recognizing file types, things like a bitmap and vector and metafile graphics. These are the three of the common ones. A bitmap image is a collection of dots. Vector graphics is based off mathematical instructions. And a metafile graphics is a combination of bitmaps and vector. There are two major types of programs when they deal with graphic files, a graphic editor and a graphic slash image viewer. So to understand bitmap and uh, raster imaging a little bit better, bitmap images will have grids of individual pixels and a raster image is also a collection of pickle, uh, pixels, but here the uh, but here the pixels are stored in rows. Raster images are a little bit better for printing because they're gonna be printing in rows. Uh, image quality is important. Screen resolution, software contributions, number of color bits used by uh, individual pixels, all of those go into the image quality. Understanding vector graphics, again, they use lines instead of dots. They store only the calculations for drawing lines. They're smaller than a bitmap, but they do preserve the quality when an image is enlarged. Corel Draw or Adobe Illustrator are uh, examples of programs that use them. Metafiles, again, a combination of both, combines both raster and vector graphics, scanned photos with some text, for example. They share advantages and disadvantages of both types. When enlarged, the bitmap uh, part loses quality. So let's go ahead and just talk about some different file formats. Standard bitmap file formats is the standard bitmap. We have a PNG, also known as the Portable Network Graphics. We have a Graphic Interchange Format, a GIF. We have a Joint Photograph Exchange or Expert Group. I've seen experts also be exchanged, JPEGs. Tagged image file formats, TIFFs, a traditional Windows bitmap, a BMP. We have a few of the vector formats, HPGL. And if you're using AutoCAD, that's going to be a DXF file. Non-standard graphic files are going to be like a TGA or raster file, uh, RTLs. Photoshop will use a PSD and Illustrator to a AI, freehand will use an FH9, paintbrush, a PCX. There's tons of programs and tons of uh, file formats out there, so keep that in mind. Witnesses or suspects can create their own digital photos. So trying to learn the file formats aren't necessarily that important because again, depending on the individual, you can create formats. So if we're looking at the raw file format, it's going to be a .raw. It's referred to as a digital negative, typically found on many higher-end cameras. The sensors in the digital camera simply record pixels on the camera's memory card, period. The raw format maintains the best picture quality, but it's space. If we're going to examine the raw file format, the biggest disadvantage is it's proprietary. Not all software can open it. So if we're uh, looking at examining a changeable image file, we'd be looking at a EXIF, commonly used on digital cameras, developed by the JEITA for storing metadata in JPEGs. Examining that exchange, we have an exit format collector for metadata. We also have a, the ability to view them. 
uh, in JPEGs. Let me give you an example here in a second. Here we have two photos, an EXIF picture, and we have a JPEG. Clarity of the tree, clarity of certain shadows, clarity of certain items within the photo. So there is some slight differences between both of them. Here's our hexadecimal for it. Again, notice our offsets and our JPEG label types. Again, here we have our JPEG file in the file markers, the FFs. So when we're looking at the exchangeable image file format, we can do that with tools such as ProDiscovery or even a EXIF reader. You can use these to extract metadata with evidence or for evidence as evidence. Pay attention to things like modification, date, times, uh, last accessed, when taken. So let's go ahead and let's look at some of the data compression types. Some image formats compress their data, a GIF and a JPEG. You'll notice that's why they're smaller. Others like a bitmap don't compress their data. So they'll use data compression tools for those formats. Data compression is going to be a, a way to take a larger file and force it to be smaller. Some of the types are going to be like a lossless compression or a lossy compression. Lossless reduces file size without removing data. Things like WinZip, FreeZip, things like that. A lossy compression permanently discards bits of information. We have a vector quantification which determines what data to discard based on vectors in the graphics. Utility for that is going to be something like LZIP. Operating system tools. There are some uh, tools built in, but again, some of them are a little bit easier to use than others. We have digital forensics tools that will actually look at the image header, and they will compare them with good header samples so we can see uh, what's there. We can also use those tools to reconstruct fragments. So we also have what's called carving or salvaging, and it's recovering any type of file fragments. The digital forensics tools that can do this are going to be looking at the Slack space to help identify image files. The nice thing is there are, repair, there are ways to repair the damaged headers. So when you're examining the recovered fragments of a file in the Slack or free space, there might be data that appears to be in the header, or there might be portions that aren't there. So if the header is partially written over, you must reconstruct that so it's readable. You, you basically start comparing the hexadecimal values of known graphic file formats, and will help allow you to piece this together. Each graphic file has a unique header value example. Each graphic file has a unique header value. For example, a, J, a JPEG file has a hexadecimal value of FFD8. And it's followed by the label JFIF for a standard JPEG. Or if it's a EXIF file, the offset's going to be 6. We're going to look at an exercise investigating possible intellectual property theft by a contract employee. Here we have the item. Here we have the portion of the damaged header. And we're able to use tools to recover it. And then he explains within the email how he does that. We're going to be doing this as a lab from our lab book once I have a little bit of time to go through those videos. So searching for that unalloc or that data in the unallocated space, it's about planning your examination. This is going to take some time. You can use things like ProDiscovery to search for uh, items, but you have to be careful of false positives. We can do clustered searching, and we have a save location. 
here's just for discovery, being able to pull out data with the hex values. Again, here is the file header overwritten with Z's, so you can compare them. Here's a list of clusters. Here's the searching again for unallocated space with mislabeled files that happen to be uh, altered intentionally for covering or uh, for the ability to cover their tracks. Again, we're doing these as labs within our, uh, our textbook once I get around to doing those videos. So we can actually look at attempting to recover those graphic files by rebuilding those file headers first. So we can try to open the file with an image viewer first to see. Uh, if it doesn't work, then we can start looking at inspecting it. If you go to open a file and the header is corrupted, this is what you'll get. Here's an example of rebuilding of the header. You're gonna notice again the offset, the offset positions. Again, notice how we rebuild that header. Rebuilding the file header using the ASCII. As you start rebuilding the header, you should start being able to view it in an image viewer. Again, we're going to be doing this as a lab, so don't stress about this too much. So, reconstructing the file fragments, not all the time will they be located close to one another. So the steps are you have to locate and export all clustered of that fragmented file. So you need all pieces of that file that you can get. It may be throughout a hard drive, so keep that in mind. You must rebuild that file header first to make it readable in the graphic viewers. So even if you're able to have the graphic data, if the header is not functioning, then it will not work. And again, there are tools out there that will do this. Here's the cluster view of this uh, file type. And then here's the reconstruction of that file type. You'll notice that there are moving bits to clear them close together. You can reconstruct these using specific tools. Again, we're doing this as a lab, so I'm kind of going through this fairly quickly. Identifying the unknown file types, you're going to have to do some searching. I'm not going to say use Google, but look for the extension types. And there's plenty of programs out there that will help you find the extension types. When necessary, you can always find those types online. And then you can start trying to find tools that will open them. You can always use a hex editor, such as WinHex, to look at the hexadecimal values of them. Uh, ZIF, for example, it's an older format, but the first three bytes of that are the same as a TIFF. There we go. Here's the analyzing portion of the file header. So after our recovery, you use an image viewer to, to open and view it, of course. No one in your program can read every file format, so do keep that in mind. So whatever file image viewer you have, make sure it's able to read the file types that you're looking at. Let's get into a little bit of stenography. Stenography is the ability to hide information inside of an image file. Two major forms, insertion is one of them, and that's gonna be hiding data that's not displayed when viewing the host file. The example of that is gonna be like a web page. Even though in reality, there's hidden text in that code. Next is substitution. This replaces bits of uh, the file with other bits of data, usually changing the last two least significant bits. So detecting this stenography is a little bit harder, but there are tools to do that. Clues for this is looking for duplicate files with different hash values. Because again, if there's bit changes, then they're gonna be modified within those hash values. Stenography programs installed on a suspect's drive is typically also a good clue that something happened. Here is a bit breakdown of the original pixels versus the hex or the edited pixels. You'll notice the first six pixels are identical. 
but then they flipped the 7th and 8th pixel. So what does that look like? Here we go. One is the original, one is the altered. They look pretty identical, so do keep that in mind. So understanding, or understanding stenography is basically a way to hide important data within an image for whatever reason. The stenography tools can be used to detect, decode, record any of that hidden data. Do keep in mind detecting variations of graphical images is time consuming. Stenography has been used to protect copyrighted material by inserting digital watermarks into a file. That way people can't just take whenever they want. So copyright entities, typically here in the US, we're dealing with the Copyright Office, they will actually embed watermarked images so you can't steal them. And that's actually the end of this chapter. We talked about the various types of graphic files, bitmaps, vectors, meta files. We talked about compression, lossless versus lossy. We talked about types of formats, raw, exif, and jpeg. We talked about being able to recover image files. And we ended with some stenography and some stego analysis. And that's the end of this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.